You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. Welcome to By the Book. This is Alan Griffith, your host for episode 78. As always, we're glad you're listening, and I'm especially glad that you're listening today. We have begun a series in our last episode, and that series has to do with living in victory. And I can't tell you how important that is. You know, there's so many people today who are a wreck mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And when somebody is messed up in those areas, then uh, there's going to be problems. Uh, There will be anger. There will be bitterness. There will be malice. There will be hatred. And then all of those things can turn to things that are said, things that are done. And uh, I don't have to go through the list to talk about the disaster that we're living through right now in this country as we are seeing our culture fall apart, and it's actually being encouraged from uh, a lot of sources, uh, government, uh, medicine, social media, big tech, whatever it might be. There's a lot out there that is pushing against every value that this country has ever had, every standard this country has ever held to. It's all under attack. One of the great problems, of course, in our day is fatherlessness. Uh, So many of uh, people who were going out and robbing and killing and whatever, when you trace it back, you find out that they didn't have a father growing up, or their father might have been in the house, but he wasn't living and doing the things that he should have been doing. And that's a critical issue today. I cannot tell you uh, how important it is to have a father in the home, a father who loves God, loves his wife, loves his children. And one of the things that impresses me about that fact is that the Bible tells us that God is a father to the fatherless. You know what that means? It means that our God puts a a premium on fatherhood. Fathers are absolutely critical to the home. Fathers are critical to the rearing and training of children. Now, sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, there is not a father. Sometimes his dad has died. Sometimes there's been the tragedy of the divorce. Sometimes there's just irresponsibility. But God says, this is so important for a young person to have a father. He said, if you don't have one, I will step in and be a father to you. And that is one of the truths of the scripture that became so valuable and precious to me when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. But there are other problems. There are so many problems today that are pressuring people and defeating people. And again, you see people who are defeated mentally. They can't think right. They can't think straight. They can't focus on things to which they need to give attention. They have trouble learning and processing and and whatever. And then you have people who are just, again, an emotional wreck. They are angry. They are frustrated. They are discouraged. They are defeated. uh, They want to quit. They want to give up. Listen, you can't live that way. And I can't live that way. And praise the Lord, the Bible tells us how to live, not necessarily to eliminate all the problems. I wish we could. I wish it told us how to do that. But it tells us how to face the challenges, face the difficulties, face the heartaches, face the trouble, whatever it might be, and still, still be able to have victory in our lives. So today, I want to pick up where we were last episode. I want to review what we have seen, and we were talking about Job. 
And the reason I started this series talking about Job is because I don't know of anyone in history that endured the pressures, the problems, the heartaches, and the troubles that this man endured. And so I like to think of it this way. If this man could survive all that he went through and still walk with God and still live the life that he wanted to live and God wanted them to live, if he could get by all that he faced, then he is a testimony to us, and he's telling us by his life, we can make it too. We can make it too. And you might be sitting there today, hopeless, feeling like, no, I cannot make it. No, I cannot go forward. No, I cannot handle life anymore. And the Bible's going to come back through the testimony of Job and many other scriptures and say, yes, you can make it. You don't have to go through your life in depression and defeat, and discouragement. You can get by those things. Do you want to? Do you want to? Well, if you do, believe me, the scriptures have the answer. The word of God has the answer. And that's why you have to see the world. You have to see life through the Bible. And if you see it through the Bible, then you can see it the way you need to see it in order to be the person you need to be and live the life that you need to live. Well, last time we were in Job 1, and I want to take just a little time to refresh us on the, the, the situation, the, the setting, if you will, of this first chapter. If you were with us, I hope you have some recollection of it. If you were not, I'm not going to take a long time. I hope you'll go back and listen to the previous episode. But the book starts off with a testimony about this man, Job. It's an incredible testimony. It is a testimony given to us by the author of the book, which may very well have been Job, but then it is a testimony that is confirmed as recorded in the book, this testimony confirmed by God. So very quickly, it says in Job 1 and verse 1, that there was this man named Job. He was perfect. That means he was spiritually mature. Doesn't mean he didn't ever sin, but he was a spiritually mature man walking with God. He was an upright man, the text says. He feared God. That means he reverenced God. He worshiped God and he eschewed evil. He rejected evil. He didn't want any part of evil. He stayed away from evil. Now, the reason I like to focus on that is because, and this is a a tough one sometimes, but I focus on it because this testimony tells us there was nothing in Job's life that made him, shall we say, worthy or deserving of the trial and the trouble and the heartache that he was called upon to endure. Now, a lot of times I have people talk to me in a counseling setting. They're going through hard times, and they they question, well, is God punishing me? And here's what I would say to them, and here's what I would say to you. If you're kind of facing that, well, maybe God is punishing me. Well, can you name something that you have done wrong in your life that you've never gotten right? if there's sin in your life or whatever it is you might have done and you've never gotten it right, well, then you need to get it right. You need to seek the forgiveness of God. You need to change your ways or whatever it might be. But listen, if you cannot say, yeah, I know I've got problems and here's what they were. If you can't say that, then don't let uh, the cloud hang over your head that makes you wonder, did I suffer this? because I am being punished by God? I had somebody ask me one time, did I suffer that problem because I I didn't have my devotions regularly? Well, listen, you ought to be in the Bible regularly. Uh, You and I need to study the scriptures. We'll never exhaust it. We need to be in it. But you and I don't serve a God who looks down from heaven and say, oh boy, you missed your 
devotions for three or four days or even a week. Now you're going to get punished for that. That is not God. Hallelujah. God is a God of of mercy. God is a God of grace. And he, he simply doesn't operate that way. So if you're here today and you're thinking, well, maybe God is punishing me. Well, again, if there's something not right, you know it's not right, get it right. God will forgive you. But don't carry this idea over your head. Well, I don't know what it could be, but I just feel like God is punishing me. Don't live there. Don't live there. There's no way out of that. If you can't pinpoint something and seek the forgiveness of God, there's no way out of that terrible imagination. Don't live there. So the testimony of Job then is outstanding because, again, this man went through some incredible heartache and trouble. But the testimony at the outset of the book is this man was living in such a way that in our minds, we would look at him and say, that man did not deserve all that he went through. Well, you and I don't deserve many things that we go through. There is spiritual purpose that you and I might not see, that God would allow some of the heartaches to come. Uh, There is a devil who's trying to destroy us, and we don't have to do anything to get him stirred up against us. He hates you. He hates me. He hates God. If he has the opportunity or his, his emissaries, demonic hosts, have an opportunity, they will cause us trouble. And then there's people out there who, for whatever reason, may cause us trouble, and we may not, again, deserve it. So that, that's good and bad because some people then they, they end up in fear. Well, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Does that mean things are going to go wrong? Well, yeah, things are going to go wrong. Now, some things we face are not as serious and hurtful as others, and some can be very, very devastating. But then in Job, uh, we're taken behind the spiritual curtain, if you will. And as we saw last time, uh, the devil accuses Job of only serving God because of God's blessings and protection upon him. And God does something very amazing. Uh, There is a hedge that has been built around Job, a hedge of protection. I suggest there's a hedge of protection around you too, because if there wasn't, Satan, we would have opportunity to destroy you in every way. But here's this hedge of protection, and God basically says, I will allow that hedge to fall a little bit, and Satan, you have the liberty to go after this man, Job. And what Satan was saying is, yeah, you just let me at him. You take away all these blessings, and listen, Job will curse you to your face. That was the challenge. Job will curse you to your face. God said, I'm going to let the hedge down a little bit. I'm going to let you go after his possessions, but you cannot touch him personally. And the devil was happy with that. And we close last time where it says in verse 12 of chapter 1, the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. To do what? To touch, as it were, to destroy what Job had. It was not a punishment from God. It was a test, a trial that God was going to allow him to go through. Boy, that happens to us. We wish it wouldn't. I don't want any more heartache. I don't want any more trouble. I don't think you do either. But I dare say my testimony doesn't match Job's testimony, and I don't know you, but I don't know that your testimony would match Job's testimony. Here's a man who was living for God, sold out to God, wanted to serve God, and all of a sudden his life is going to come under incredible attack. 
And how he responds to that is important. It's important for his testimony, and it is important for you and me to see it and to wrestle with it and think about it and ca- compared to how you and I live, <clears throat> how you and I respond <clears throat> when things go wrong in our life. And again, I don't know of anybody who had go wrong in their life what this man Job had go wrong in his life. And then I remind you that Job, as we move on and see what happens to him, Job was totally unaware of the conversation that had occurred between God and Satan. He was just trying to live for God, totally unaware of the attacks that were coming, totally blindsided by what happened to him on a particular day. Verse 13 of chapter 1 says, and there was a day. Just like you and I have a day in our life, there was a day in Job's life. I suggest to you everything started off normal, which therefore would include a, a spiritual beginning to Job's day. Now, why do I say that? Because verse 13 says, there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Now, evidently, and I'm trying to understand the way the the Bible puts it, but evidently this was somebody's birthday. It might have been the birthday of the eldest brother or somebody else in the family, but earlier in chapter one, we are told that they gathered together each on his day. So it was not unusual for this kind of gathering of the children. And we were also told earlier in chapter one how Job acted when he knew his children were going to be meeting. And so it says this, verse four of chapter one, his sons, Job's sons, went and feasted in their houses, everyone on his day, that would seem to be his birthday, and sent and called for their sisters to eat and to drink with them. And that again is what we're seeing in verse 13. Now listen to verse five. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So as we come to this section that we're looking at today, we have every reason to believe that on that morning, Job rose up early out of spiritual concern for his children. He rose up early and he offered offerings for them, uh, hoping that that would uh, draw them to the Lord and that God would no doubt watch over them and so on. What a man this is. So here's this day. He gets up early. He's got his family in mind. He's offering offerings for them that they might be sanctified before God. And so we read this then in verse 14. There came a messenger unto Job. So here's Job living his day. We don't know what time of day it is. We know what he did early in the morning, but he's living his day. He's doing whatever he normally does. And all of a sudden, a messenger shows up to Job's house. And verse 14 goes on and says this, that the messenger said, the oxen were plowing. That's what they should have been doing. The asses feeding beside them. That's what should have been going on. And then the messenger said, and the Sabians. The Sabians were descendants of of Sheba. Uh, They were people of uh, Seba or Sheba. And the messenger says, all of a sudden, the people 
of Seba came, these Sabians came, and they fell upon them. They came, and there were the oxen, uh, there were the she-asses, and all of a sudden this group comes, it must have been a whole lot of them because there were 500 yoke of oxen, there were 500 she-asses, and all of a sudden the Sabians come and they killed all the servants of Job that were out there with these animals. They killed them with the edge of the sword. And then this man says that all of the animals were taken away, all the servants were killed, and this man alone, this messenger, says, I'm the only one who got away, and I have come to tell you what happened. Well, what a jolt that must have been. But why did they do that? What's going on? How could this happen? And yet, he no doubt being shocked by this and considering it is all of a sudden confronted with another messenger. So verse 16 says, while he was yet speaking, the first messenger is just getting through his story of what happened. And this other messenger comes in and says, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. He says, listen, lightning has just struck. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep. I can't imagine what that lightning was like, what that storm was like, because earlier in the chapter, we're told that Job had, listen to it, 7,000 sheep. Now, I have seen some large bolts of lightning and some tremendous lightning storms, and you probably have too, but this one must have really been something because the lightning fell, burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. Man, is this a true story? Yeah. Yeah, could it be this is a true story? Yeah. And then verse 17 says, while he was yet speaking, here the second messenger is just finishing up his message, while he's yet speaking, there came also another. Here comes the third one. And he said, the Chaldeans, the people of Chaldea, made out three bands and fell upon the camels. Now Job earned th or owned 3,000 camels. And here comes these three groups of Chaldeans, and they come down and they fall upon the, the camels and they take, took them all away and they killed the servants who were watching them. Can you and I even grasp this? Can you and I take this in? And then verse 18. Verse 18 is just beyond comprehension. Because while this third messenger was speaking, there came another, there came a fourth. And he said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness straight line winds, tornado, whatever it might be, there came a great wind from the wilderness <clears throat> and the wind smote the four corners of the house and it, the house, fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. It's hard to fathom this. I don't know what's ever gone wrong in your life. I've had things go wrong in my life. You have things that have gone wrong in your life, but I suggest neither you nor me have ever gone through this experience of Job. He didn't know it was coming. There was no warning. 
He was walking with God. He was praying, sacrificing for his children. The man was doing everything right. And virtually his whole life falls apart right before his eyes. The oxen are gone. The she-asses are gone. The sheep are gone. The camels are gone. And his children are gone. How do you respond to that? How do you react to that? Well, we are told how Job responded, and I will never get over it. It says in verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle. He he tore his clothing, his garments. Speaking of his brokenness, he shaved his head. Speaking of his his barrenness, if you will. This man was broken just like you and I would be broken. But then the text says something else that I'm not sure you and I can fully identify with. He fell down upon the ground and worshipped. We'll talk during another episode about the importance of giving thanks. It's part of the pathway of victory. I see it in the scriptures. I do my best to live it. And the challenge is to give thanks in all things. That is not a a feeling of thankfulness. It is an act of faith that looks beyond the circumstances, looks beyond our own ability to comprehend what is going on or why it is going on. It looks to God and says, God, I trust you. I don't understand the why, but I want to see from an eternal perspective, not an earthly and temporal perspective. And therefore, Lord, by faith, I give you thanks. We're going to talk more about that. Well, that, that in essence, is what's happening here with Job. This is incredible. What does, he, what does he do? He falls down upon the ground. He doesn't fall down upon the ground in brokenness. I've seen people do that. I've come close to doing that, where you're just so broken, you just want to fall down. But of Job, it says, he fell down upon the ground and worshipped. He worshipped. He reverenced God. He honored God. And he said something in his worship. Here's what he said in verse 21. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. He said, In my birth, In the beginning of my life on earth, he said, I had absolutely nothing. And now he says, and just as I had nothing when I came into this world, he said, naked shall I return thither. When I die, he was saying, I guess I'll have nothing. But then he said this, what a perspective, what a heart, what a man. He said, the Lord gave. So I came to the earth with nothing. And everything that I have had, I recognize God gave it to me. Now, Job must have been a hard worker, but there are many hard workers who don't succeed. 
And Job is recognizing that, whether he worked hard or not, I believe he must have. But he says this, God gave to me what I had. God gave it to me. And so he said this, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. I recognize that what I had, God gave me and God had the right to take it away. And for whatever reason, God decided to take it away. That was his perspective. And then he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And this commentary, which we might expect in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. We'll talk about this more next episode. Lord bless you.